Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And this is the 801st Sermon Brainwave recording. We forgot mm -hmm. to mention that last week that was 800. No so way. let's celebrate 801. 801. That's amazing. Know, right? It is yeah. amazing. And thanks for listening to us. This is the podcast for September 12th, 2021. Uh, the first reading is Isaiah 50, 4 through 9a. Uh, the semi-continuous uh, Old Testament reading is Proverbs 1, 20 through 33. The Psalm is 116, 1 through 9. The epistle is James 3, 1 through 12. And the gospel reading is Mark 8, 27 through 38. And before we get into it, I just would like it noted that I hate when Cliff Black writes the commentaries for the gospel because he writes so much better than I do. And his insights are so good. I feel just like a $2 bill at a party where only 50s are invited. Mm. It's really good commentary. A good way to spend your time. And welcome to the first Sunday of the program year in a lot of churches. Yeah. Rally day. Rally day. And that's going to look, I think, uh, very different uh, still for a lot of churches and how to how to navigate that. And we should also mention that uh, it's it's September 12, but uh, September 11 is 20 years uh, since 9-11. And uh, there might be some recognition of that as well, um, especially we're recording this a little earlier, but uh, especially with what's uh, happening in Afghanistan. And so um, there, yeah, there might be, there might be some uh, realities around that as well. So we are aware of that too. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine a better text in some ways to, to speak into that than the text uh, of the confession of the Messiah uh, and then the explanation where Jesus teaches what it means. You know, he began to teach them the Son of Man must undergo suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. And there it is. The mm -hmm. lectionary has set it up. What do you say this weekend? This is God. This mm -hmm. is who God is. This mm -hmm. is what it looks like. And you were called to follow, as Cliff Black makes a, a, a very pointed deal of in his commentary. This is who we follow. Yeah, and not only this is who we follow, but uh, what that following entails. Uh, what is that? What is that going to? Uh, what is that going to look like? And as Cliff Black says, how do we? How do we pretend? How do we? How is it that we try to wiggle out of what Jesus means by this? Uh, that we pretend that well, Jesus doesn't really mean it that way, or just it's not you know that big of a deal. Uh, and the ways and, and, you know, to think about in our, in our preaching and in our thinking about our text, the ways in which we do uh, wiggle out of, as he talks about, uh, our obedience and our responsibility, uh, but particularly our obedience to what does it mean to claim Jesus as the Messiah. And I think it was, uh, it's helpful too. I mean, he talks about the verbally abusive language of this passage, but I think that that is also communicative of this, of the seriousness of this. So that in verse 30, uh, when, when Jesus says, and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him, uh, that, you know, these, this is the same language as the exorcisms from 125 that we're going back to that first miracle, or not miracle, that first act of Jesus, uh, well, kind of a miracle, but first act of Jesus in the gospel of Mark, that exorcism. And so this is serious business. This is, you know, what is it that, you know, might even think of what, you know, what is it that you're possessed with? What is it that you are going to say? Uh, and what will you confess, uh, particularly in the midst of uh, that which surrounds you that buys for your attention? Yeah, the, the, the Christological disclosures in Mark, right, the places where Jesus talks about what does it mean for him to be the Messiah, uh, are also discipleship disclosures. They're also the places where Jesus talks about, this is what I expect from all of you, which he hasn't done a whole lot of prior in this gospel. Um, he's been hard on his disciples and let them know that he's disappointed in them, 
from time to time, but it's not exactly clear what they're supposed to do other than be with him and to follow and the case of the 12 being sent out. So another way of putting that is the more we learn about who Jesus is and what his fate is, the more we understand what discipleship, what it means to follow this kind of a Messiah looks like. Uh, and in Mark in particular, it's an entirely, what's the opposite of rosy, unrosy picture of what discipleship looks like. There's not a lot of promise here of, uh, other passages have a little bit of this, of you know support and community and family. It's largely a picture of, of obedience and following uh, unto death. So that language of denying yourself, taking up your cross and following is crucial. And that's not just, I think, a literary feature of Mark. That's part of, I think, the way in which this gospel, is ima this gospel imagines how do you come to know who Jesus is. It's about where you situate yourself. It's about where you go. It's about how you, how and where you put your life um, on the line, so to speak. And that's hard to preach because well, no offense, none of the three of us have done that. I, I don't know if I even know anybody who's really done that in a kind of severe way that this gospel might imagine. Uh, that shouldn't slow down the way we preach about it or the way we explore what that looks like for a community to do those things. Yeah, I, I mean, I do know people, um, but it's uh, that have done this. I mean, uh, Cliff Lack at the end of his commentary tells one story and such, you know, such stories of... Uh, that sort of sacrifice are available. It, the The church I was a member of some time ago had a immigrant family who they, they had lost everything for their faith. I mean, the soldiers came in the front door and the long story is they made it out the back door and just headed across the desert in Africa and were eventually able to make it to a refugee camp and so on. But like you said, not us. Uh, but this disclosure of, of uh, I really like that, the Christological disclosure, because the question is, who is Jesus, right? Who do you say that I am, you know? And Peter says the Messiah, but then the disclosure of what that means to be the Christ, and then for what it means for us to be called to follow the Christ. I actually think this is maybe a great emphasis for the fall is following Jesus, Uh because, uh, uh, you know, coming back in the fall on a lot of places that have been open for a long time, numbers are down uh, uh, in, in worship. And uh, it is time for a call, a radical call for discipleship and following. I was thinking that too, Rolf, uh, particularly looking ahead to next week where you get, you continue in verse nine, and there's also uh, realities about uh, about what discipleship is, and that focus on discipleship right now. Been talking a lot with uh, preachers over the summer, pastors over the summer, and what I have been uh, thinking about is like a, a a crisis, is if you will, of discipleship uh, in this past year and a half. Not a crisis like the sky is falling, but a crisis of discernment. Like, what does discipleship look like? What does discipleship mean? What does it mean to follow Jesus when you don't have your usual parameters in place to do so? Uh, whether that's you know going to church, attending worship, the things with you know, the things in which you are involved at your church, when those are stripped away, when those are pulled away, what what are you left with? What does that what does that look like when you can't engage in those usual activities? And so I think it I think it's really important for pastors to talk about. How has, how, how, what are you thinking about discipleship right now? How is your understanding of what it means to follow Christ changed over the course of the last year and a half and, and will likely continue to do so? And so if the church doesn't have and host those conversations, who then is going to? And I think it's a, I think it's a question on every believer's mind and heart of what, does my discipleship count if I don't attend worship? Does God still see my devotion and my obedience? I think those are some of the questions that are pretty, pretty uh, heavy out there. I like how you phrase that as hosting a conversation about that, because in my experience, there's a lot of ordinary hidden discipleship taking place uh, among people who are uh, maybe have always been doing this, but have found ways to step into discipleship in new ways during the pandemic. 
that might surprise some of the people in their congregations uh, to know that they're doing this. Not that you have to necessarily make all of this public, but it becomes really interesting to think about if nobody's watching, what does discipleship look like? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways now we're moving back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, but uh, you know, what does that, what does that actually look like then for us as a church to encourage that, to know it's happening, to support that, to give people the space to practice discipleship if they choose not to come back in person to a sanctuary, but participate online. I mean, all these kinds of mm -hmm. things that we would have answered very, very differently two years ago. Um, so it is a crisis, but crises reveal things. And, yes, they, and they're moments of discernment. And they are, but they also sometimes uh, allow people to step up in ways that they haven't stepped up before or in ways that haven't been as visible before. So yeah, it's it becomes really interesting so that there's mm -hmm. not a kind of one size fits all imagination of what discipleship looks like so that no preachers are implying, right? If you really love Jesus, you would be here in the sanctuary or, you know, the kinds of things that might be well intentioned, but will not be helpful, I think, to, mm -hmm. to, to the whole of your congregation. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. And again, hosting, uh, inviting that conversation that is a, mm -hmm. it's a dialogue and a sharing around what have you discovered about your own discipleship in the last year and a half that you just never thought of? And, and for, I think you're right, for people to hear affirmation of how they have, uh, how they have kept the faith uh, during this time and, uh, and persevered in that. Um, the other thing I was going to uh, mention too is this is the first time in 835, this is the first time since uh, the opening verses of Mark since 1-1 and since uh, 14, 114 and 115 that we have the term gospel or good news. And I think that is an important backdrop to this passage as well. For the sake of the gospel, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel. And if, particularly if we go back to, uh, if we if we go back to fourteen and fifteen, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Believe in this. Trust in this. And so that that this this call to discipleship is for the sake of uh, recognizing and bring at, recognizing that the kingdom of God is here, and that's part of this role of taking on one's cross is recognizing that the kingdom of God is here. And where is it that we're pointing to that and recognizing it uh, in how we go about uh, our lives and our obedience? One last thing before we go on. I mean, it. Uh... If people just look, if pastors look ahead and you're thinking, okay, maybe I'll take this discipleship theme and run with it, there are going to be opportunities because the next uh, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be in Mark 9 and then and then a couple of weeks in Mark 10. So this central, this central section of Mark with these, as Matt called it, Christological disclosures and discipleship disclosures, uh, you could look ahead and frame uh, a trajectory so it's not just a one-off comment but we we should really move on and speaking i mean you know frankly speaking of authors who write well it's the website's filled with it this day old friends and classmates julie Claussen's, jim mead elaine james it's uh it's wonderful it's a uh, seminary kind of week well elaine's not but yes it is it is certainly a uh old uh it's great to hear uh such trustworthy voices um uh the and Julie's commentary on the so-called second servant song, I actually don't even think those things are helpful. Or is this the third? I think it might be the third servant song. But yes, it's the third. But uh, it, it's really helpful. I mean, the thing that jumps out to me about the text itself is um, obviously it's it echoes what's going on uh, with the revelation of the Christ in the gospel when it says this teacher and uh, sustains the weary and and it seems to do it through vicarious suffering in some way I mean, uh you know notice this I, I notice the language about about the um the body my ear right my back my cheeks my face you know that the the, the this vicarious suffer has given uh, the, the very body 
uh, for the sake and then enduring things for the sake of sustaining the weary. I, I particularly like, I, I realized I'm like just pulling out one little line, but, uh, but particularly when you think about the way in which this text describes those those adversaries, right, or the, that adversarial sense, or who's against me, uh, and the and obviously the connection to uh, taking up one's cross, and what does that and what does that mean? But but uh, verse eight, let us stand up together. I mean, that's the other that's the other thing. Going back to your initial comment, Rolf, that this is could be a uh, some kind of reunion in terms of Rally Sunday, what that's going to look like, we don't entirely know. But, uh, but whenever, we, whenever we do talk about discipleship and, and obedience and living out and embodying our faith, this is not, this is, we don't do this alone. And maybe this is, maybe this is the time really to emphasize that because how alone people have felt or isolated, they have felt in, uh, in, in doing exactly that in their obedience and their ongoing living out their faith and yet and yet not having that the usual communal realities around them uh, to to support and undergird those efforts. And so maybe this is a reminder too that this is not something we do this together. We do this as a community of faith, uh, and and to remind people of that. That's where the language of teaching is really important, I think. You know, Julie Claussen points out about the servant here as a teacher. Uh, Rolf pointed out earlier in in Mark chapter eight that Jesus teaches. Uh, teaching is a more common verb for what Jesus does in Mark than preaching is, I believe. Um, how do we teach others through our suffering, through our faithfulness, through our obedience, and how that looks, like you said, Caroline, in a, um, in a communal setting where um, different parts of the body have things to teach, not just things to report about right, or, or news to share, and, and what, that, what that looks like, how a congregation creates space for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the emphasis, I mean, the good news here is that God is the one who helps, as, you know, as, as Julie does point out, it's, it, uh, quote, God is the one who helps him, who vindicates him, who protects him against those who want to declare him guilty, who saves him from shame and disgrace. I mean, that is finally, it's the agency and salvific movement of God that is what sustains those who suffer. Which I think is a really good connection to Psalm, the Psalm. What yeah, you just said, Rolf. Jump to the Psalm. Don't you think because uh, you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I mean, this, this, uh, I love the Lord because uh, the Lord has heard my voice and my supplications. And so I think if you went in that direction with the sermon, you could uh, use the language of the psalm to, uh, to support that and uh, give your sermon vocabulary for that theme. Yeah, uh, this is a this is a great psalm. It's as as Jim Mead points out in the commentary. It's not just these nine verses, but uh, it's the only time these verses are assigned in the in the three year lectionary outside of Holy Week when we when we would normally hear them. You know, because of you know the line this the the snares of death encompass me. It's a song of thanksgiving uh, about having come through and. Uh, by God's graciousness, having been delivered in, uh, from, in, as uh, is repeatedly from death, and therefore to walk in the land of the living. And I think Jim talks about an old Eugene Peterson piece about walking in the land of the living, which is powerful. Anything Proverbs. else? On and this are, is this one of how many readings? I'm trying to remember where we are. And well, so we've already been in Proverbs. Yeah, we're talking uh, about Solomon. Yes. Yeah, right, right, right. So this is the semi-continuous. Right, um, this is four total. Yeah, so you get what we had was we had um, on August 22nd, Solomon's prayer for wisdom, or, or at least that was, uh, maybe that was earlier, but you've got Solomon in the, and then, so then we had the Song of Solomon. So this is uh, as the semi-continuous lectionary is moving through, and now we're going to get some Proverbs right. And I can't remember, do we get any Ecclesiastes just to, uh, I don't think so, but. Um, 
Anyway, right. so yes, yeah, that's no. why we're in Proverbs because it's the, of the association with Solomon. Right, with Solomon. I just couldn't, re I couldn't remember where we were in the Proverbs cycle. Lectionary designers said we Solomon could, stuff. I think they said we could, we could devote some passages to talking about Solomon's life or we could just share some literature associated with him. And if you've read about Solomon's life, this is way more fun. Indeed. I think Correct. so. so yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, just, I, this is a time, well, Elaine James has got two fantastic commentaries on Proverbs 1 next week on Proverbs 31, just as a sneak peek. So mm -hmm. it could be a great little two-week series if you wanted to spend time on wisdom and talk about wisdom as a theological category. You don't necessarily have to anchor it to Solomon and, and his reputation as a, as a wisdom teacher, can if you want, but to, you know, to talk about divine wisdom or the idea of wisdom as an emanation of the, of the divine, as a creative force, as a life-sustaining force, as a revelatory force, and mm -hmm. of course that connects to Jesus. You might want to choose some different passages than what you've got, but um, plenty of New Testament authors see a connection between Jesus and wisdom as well, mm -hmm. but not a bad place to jump in, right? chapter one and she's got some great comments about how to deal with the binaries that you get here and how to um um how to avoid falling into some common errors when working with right. the i i would encourage whether or not you're preaching on proverbs uh, i would encourage everybody to read that commentary by elaine james because it's it's just a it's a reminder in the you know the wider parlance of of how we uh, talk about uh, how we talk about the roles of women in the church and uh, and the way and we talk talk about women in general that uh, the way the the ways in which proverbs has been used uh, to to undergird or justify uh, patriarchy and so she's she's just does a wonderful job with that and uh, from personal experience I would highly recommend the book Down Girl the Logic of Misogyny which she lists in the bibliography. Uh, but uh, but her her discussion of this is just worth a worth a read regardless. But it's um, I, but it but I I think your your point is important, Matt. Is the way in which we talk about wisdom, we think about wisdom, and and how is it that we have uh, how is it that we return to. Uh, a theological understanding of wisdom and what do we mean by that? And there might be a, there, a, a preacher or two out there might think, yeah, this is maybe where I need to go right now when we think about the kind of wisdom that we need to move through what we're moving through uh, with, the, with uh, the continuing pandemic and how we re Re, uh, rethink about what churches and like we said, discipleship and faith and how was God working in this? What, what are we drawing on? What are our resources in, in those kinds of conversations? And, and, uh, and if wisdom is it, then what do we mean by that? Do we mean the world's wisdom? Do we mean, uh, do we mean God's wisdom and how are we going to talk about that and differentiate that? So that might be a direction that, uh, that people go. And as well as Elaine James commentary with regard to, um, Ignoring wisdom has a vast uh, has vast ecological uh, uh, implications, and particularly uh, with the latest report out of climate change, um, maybe this is a focus that you decide uh, for the fall of of uh, of of how 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 is my church going to think about uh, ecology as a theological category. You know how I would use the Proverbs text this week? How? Any guesses? What? How I would how I would use the Proverbs text? Uh, no. What if you're supposed to say liturgically, right? Oh, liturgically. No, I would use oh. it pedagogically. So here's what uh. you can do. Don't waste these two. You've got yourself a two-week Sunday morning uh, or any any day of the week uh, adult ed class here. Just. Um, print out Elaine James's commentary. Give them uh, Proverbs one, Proverbs thirty-one next week. And um, sit people down and have conversations about this. You know what I mean? You've got some great resources here. So there you go. Yeah, I, I finally got in on that. You are, you're always the like, use it liturgically. I'm saying use it, use it uh, pedagogically. Pedagogically. Faith formationally. <laughs> the, um, James. You know, the thing, of, I can't remember if it was Ellen Davis who said about Proverbs that this is, um, she said something to the effect that Proverbs is, 
uh, the wisdom for everyday living when bushes, uh, voices don't speak from burning bushes and lame people mm. don't jump up from the waters or something like that. And I found that essential, that idea moving that this, uh, this, is, this also is from God, even though Israel's major covenantal for, you know, uh, themes are, are missing, are not present. I shouldn't say they're missing. They're not present in Proverbs, but this also is uh, from God that the common wisdom associated with uh, daily life and uh, it's very important. So we are in the middle of, we are in the middle of th five weeks in James. Yeah. This is the third of five and the importance of speech. Yeah, especially, and this, the funny thing is this, would have gone with a lot of the body of Proverbs because Proverbs is very, very concerned with the wickedness and damage we can do with our speech. And uh, it's sort of, for me, it was ironic. It's like, boy, they should have had some of this part of Proverbs in there too, uh, about how much damage uh, we can do. Uh, hear it with the tongue, uh, the tongue as a metaphor for speech. The tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body and sets on fire the cycle of nature. It's just a it's kind of pure law, but it's, it's great po poetry to remind us. But for working preachers then to remind us that that also then the utterance of the gospel with that same, uh, you know, with the same organ, one speech is uh, the calling. Uh, to, to counteract that all the damage that is done uh, through through sinful speech. It's, uh, it's a great passage to come back to one of the main theological points that James makes like throughout the whole book, which is uh, this problem of double-mindedness or this problem of not being who you really are, which comes out especially in verses 9 through 12. Um, so you refer to this as law, Rolf, if there is a sense of, I'm going to try to pull a law gospel move here. I don't usually do this kind of thing. So I'm going to take the trainer wheels off. If there's a gospel point here, it's, but that's not who you are, right? That's not who you were created to be. That somehow that's the, the kinds of things speech can do. The reason it freaks out the author of James so much is because it's, it's, it's not congruous with who you are in Christ, right? So there's this kind of, move there. Uh, James just doesn't simply understand how somebody can be two things at the same time. It's part of the author's, uh, part of the author's mindset, right? How can you act in a way that somehow defies your nature? Um, and a preacher can do something with that. Yeah, the uh, it, it, verses 9 and 10, with it, that it's the tongue, we bless the Lord and we curse those made in God's image. From the same mouth comes blessing and curse. I just, uh, the funny, I, uh, You've got you guys. I don't have this T-shirt, but it probably would fit on a coffee cup for me. Which is, I love Jesus, but I swear a little. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I was maybe using some less than laudatory language at work, probably thirty years ago when I was working at the security office at University of St. Thomas. And one of the one of the guards uh, said, "You kiss your mama with that mouth," and that's really that's the that's really the point that James is making, which is. You praise God with the same mouth you do that with, and and the, and as Matt says, really appalling move is no, that's not who you are. God has made you into somebody else. Be that person that God has made you. 